In Germany, the Nazis first came for the communists and I didn't object because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't object because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists and I didn't object because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics, but I didn't object because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me. My name is Robert Culp. I'm standing in the Simon Wiesenthal Center's Museum of Tolerance. People from all over the world flock to this unique museum, which focuses on racism and prejudice, and the history of the Holocaust, the ultimate example of man's inhumanity to man. You are about to see a documentary on Germany today. This film highlights an alarming upturn in intolerance in a country which hoped reunification would heal old wounds. The world cannot imagine another Kristallnacht, yet this intolerance has passed far beyond idle rhetoric and flared into acts of shocking violence. There are millions of decent people in Germany who are deeply concerned about the few. Thankfully, they are determined that history will not repeat itself. Adolf Hitler's ambitions ignited an inferno that raged through Europe and by the end of World War II had consumed Germany itself. It was only after the fall of the Third Reich that the atrocities of the Nazis' final solution, the Holocaust, were fully understood. The attempted genocide of an entire people, the Jews, and the murder of many others to achieve a master race. War crimes trials set about punishing the guilty and cries of never again echoed around a stunned world. The powers of the day embarked upon a process to ensure that the rights of all men would once and forever be protected. A new German constitution specifically intended to preserve the political and religious freedom of its citizens was introduced and ratified. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was designed to protect the freedom and dignity of every individual and was adopted by the United Nations. The Council of Europe and the European Convention on Human Rights were established to preserve fundamental freedoms for individuals. But have these efforts of the past 50 years been in vain? Despite the fall of the Iron Curtain and the destruction of the Berlin Wall and the first democratic elections in over 60 years, the truth is many fear that the hope for a new Germany has not been fulfilled. In the last few years, rumblings of discontent have erupted into demonstrations and right-wing extremism has emerged once again. As in Hitler's Third Reich, extremists in a reunified Germany are looking for scapegoats to blame for their current social and economic woes. They are finding them in minority groups seeking economic, political, or religious refuge. In fact, anyone perceived as an outsider in Germany today, the bigotry and intolerance continue to grow. The Nazis are the winners of the Cold War. They are the only winners because both sides lose the Cold War. And when the history, and the history can repeat, why? Because the mistakes that every generation makes are the same. The right-wing extremism has increased dramatically in Germany since reunification. Especially in the past year, we have noticed an increase in the membership 
in various right-wing groups. More than anyone else, uh, the skinheads have been drastically influenced by these extremist ideas. But even more shocking to us than the increase in right-wing extremism was the tremendous upsurge of violence against foreigners, particularly against people seeking asylum in this country. It is a fact that the womb that gave birth to the violence to the racist violence in Germany is not infertile, but capable of bearing violence once again under the mark of racism. I think quite simply that we are living in a time of transition in Europe, and Europe will have to decide whether it will march to the right or whether we are democratic enough to fight it. In 1990, the year leading up to formal reunification, 375 acts of violence by right-wing extremists were recorded by the German government. In 1991, a year later, that figure leapt to nearly 1,500 with three people killed. The following year, 2,285 incidents of right-wing violence occurred, leaving 17 dead. Of the dead, seven were foreigners, and the others were Germans, unlucky enough to fall into categories offensive to the extremists. Homosexuals, homeless, liberals, and other left-wing sympathizers. A similar number of attacks occurred in 1993, with the tragic death toll rising to more than 30, and more homes and places of worship destroyed. Council of Europe is worried about um, intolerance, or extreme forms of nationalism wherever they occur. And uh, therefore, we're worried about the situation in Germany, just as we're worried about the situation in many other European countries. This was always an intolerant country. So I think it's important to know that Germany has an old tradition of intolerance. Since 2000 years, um, it's a tradition to uh, to fight with all means against people who are different, who think different, look different, act different. Uh, when you have uh, the skinheads on the streets and uh, acting violent, okay, then you have to have the police and you have to uh, uh, control them. But that doesn't touch the roots of this thinking of this violence. I'm kind of um, afraid of what's happening in Germany right now. I spent a year abroad and I saw the fear of other people of Germany and made me kind of feel kind of really bad because you can see all these people looking at Germany and thinking that everybody here is a Nazi and uh, you just want to yell at them and say, no, it's not that way. But when I came back, I thought maybe they, they were right that there are more Nazis here than we ever thought. It is estimated by the German Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution that there are more than 42,000 right-wing extremists active in Germany today, including members of several neo-Nazi parties and a much larger group that has no formal political agenda but is virulently prejudiced against foreigners, anyone they consider less than a model German. In 1992, a survey found that 51% of all Germans were sympathetic to the concept of Germany for the Germans. This slogan has been the exclusive chant of the neo-Nazi movement since 1989 and was also adopted by the ultra-right-wing Republikaner Party. It's true, there are 1.7 million Muslims living in Germany, but one must keep in mind that these people are not German citizens. They are foreigners. They are guests here. And so they will be treated and accepted as guests, but definitely only as guests, not as citizens. They therefore should not be overestimated. When they strive to obtain, or rather fight to obtain, privileges, 
beyond their constitutional rights as guests, that is wrong. That is unacceptable. They consider Islam to be a minority religion, and above everything else, a religion of foreigners, of the immigrants in this country. The history of Islam in Germany is almost ignored. They're attacking, for example, Jewish cemeteries. We have uh, four attacks against Jewish cemeteries in, in Germany. There was uh, one uh, attack in uh, Ludwigshafen uh, against a Turkish restaurant, which burned up. There were some burning uh, attacks in uh, Saxonia, and there were uh, four attacks against Jewish cemeteries at the same night. So we have already attacks of those people, and uh, they are anti-Semitic, anti uh, like the Nazi movement in the 30s. In March of last year, the UN passed a resolution calling for the protection of the Roma population in Europe. The only country that was against this resolution and that abstained from voting was the Federal Republic of Germany. This is typical of Germany's policies. If one takes into account the fact that Germany has been responsible for the murder of millions of Roma, that today, just walking down the streets of Germany, the Roma have to fear for their lives, then one would find it in keeping for this country to advocate on an international level an ongoing policy of discrimination against the Roma without their wanting to account for this discrimination. And so it's easy to understand why Germany didn't sign the resolution. We get from Germany approximately um, four to five hundred complaints every year. Out of that are registered about 130 to 140 complaints. I think people are more intolerant today, full stop. They are more intolerant. Even the kids in the schoolyards are more intolerant. People losing their religious allegiances and their religious roots are going to be more intolerant. If I were a foreigner, I'd be well and truly scared. In a poll conducted this year, more than one in five Germans admitted harboring negative feelings toward Jews, and nearly half believed that anti-Semitism in Germany was likely to increase. Over a third of the people polled were against building a national Holocaust museum in Germany. They said that the Holocaust was not relevant today because it happened more than 50 years ago. But the prejudice was not just against Jews. Many of those surveyed confessed to not wanting to live next to Romanies, Arabs, Turks, or even Poles. We had three spells, three waves of right-wing uh, extremism in Germany. The first one was in the early uh, 50s, mainly around uh, parties of uh, uh, national socialist complexions, and these parties were banned in the first half of, of the 50s. The second wave of uh, right-wingism uh, came in the uh, 60s with the National um, Democratic uh, Party, and that uh, uh, wave was uh, gradually integrated within the more uh, uh, established parties. And the third wave is now that of the 80s, mainly of the late uh, 1980s and that of the early 90s, and the difference to all right-wing uh, tendencies uh, before that period are in a twofold uh, sense. One is the coexistence of organized right-wingism and uh, unorganized one, and the other one is a dramatic increase in the uh, total number of uh, violent uh, actions against all different uh, uh, groups, mainly uh, foreigners. 
German unification, unification came just in the period where the enormous, powerful German industries, industry got structural problems, not only because of the worldwide recession, but these are homemade structural problems we overexpanded our capacities in car industry and machinery and chemistry, all those big pillars of Germany's industrial power. So that we have now, or during this year, we are going to get to approach the very famous number of perhaps five or six million jobless famous number because it was exactly that number of jobless we had in uh, in Germany during the late uh, 20s when the Nazi movement rose. I have been charged in my work in 1981 and 1989 to organize so-called conferences on intolerance and uh, already at the second conference at the end of the 80s we stated that the situation had rather become worse than it was seen in 1981. The situation has become very bad. Before there was hatred of foreigners, but you couldn't feel it as strongly as you do now. Between World War II and reunification, Jewish cemeteries and Holocaust memorials were occasionally desecrated. Foreigners working in Germany were sometimes harassed, and every year on Hitler's birthday, in what was West Germany, small bands of diehards and neo-Nazis staged demonstrations. But following reunification, the violence became more widespread and more brutal. Neo-Nazi groups active in the East and the West banded together and became bolder in their attacks and demonstrations. In the 70s, the German authorities cracked down ruthlessly on left-wing extremists like the Bader Meinhof gang. Now, police, justice, and other authorities appear, in many cases, to be turning a blind eye. When I look at it, I see the parallelity of phenomenons. When I look in the Nazi times, the guys who started the whole thing violently in the street by beating up somebody because he was a Jew or looked different, were the so-called SA, the guys with the brown shirts. And it's true. They didn't know what they were doing. They were just violent people, but they were used by somebody. Today, when I look at the skinheads, it's right that most of them have no idea what they're doing. They don't know what the Third Reich was. They're not educated that much. But I think that they're used by somebody. Uh, because it's, it's very interesting that when they started out as a very little group, the police did not act or not react. So it became bigger. They got lots of media coverage. So underdogs, nobodies, became famous overnight. And it became a big fashion because uh, all these young guys suddenly found themselves on the covers of the big magazines, in the newspapers, and everybody could be uh, a little Rambo, you know. And it was very simple. You just stick a swastika on your shirt, and you shave your head, and uh, you can be a hero. You can be famous. I, for instance, have cancelled my vacation in Turkey because I want to stay here. When I leave this house, I'm always afraid of whether it will still be here when I come back to it. Before I go to bed at night, I go through the whole house and check all the doors and windows to make sure they're locked. Many Turks, many, many Turks have told me again and again that they are afraid to go to sleep because they don't know what will happen to them during the night. And since the perpetrators of violence don't have a particular plan that they are following, practically every house is threatened. Those most threatened, of course, are women and children because they comprise the largest group within this minority. I myself have a 15-year-old daughter, and until the Ministry of Culture intervened, she was greeted in the schoolyard with Heil Hitler. 
She couldn't even avoid this heckling on the school bus. And it didn't come to an end until the Ministry of Culture stepped in. The parents of the other children tried to play down the whole thing, but in principle, no one was really punished. What this means is that although the Hitler salute is indeed forbidden in Germany, in reality, it is being used. With this, it started in uh, city Hoyerswerda. The uh, government brought uh, 80 people, asylum seekers. And they were in one house together. And then came about 20, 30 hooligans and threw their Molotov cocktail stones against these people. They were arrested. Next morning, they were released from the prison. And in the afternoon, the government evacuated the 80 people. And this was a terrible mistake. This gave, gave to the hooligans a feeling that uh, they have achieved something. It's nice that Germany has uh, the image of being a tolerant country. And I must say that uh, I only came to know that it's not the case in the religious and spiritual way when I became a sannyasin. Only then I realized and I experienced that tolerance was just uh, a word on a piece of paper because you are not allowed what is written down in the Constitution to um, live and offer yourself in the same way as everybody else does. Yeah? You get defamated, uh, they try to destroy your reputation and your image, and uh, it is criminal what they do. We had all hoped that after the first arson attack on foreigners, there would not be any recurrences, but there have been new ones. I can only hope that there won't be any further attacks on handicapped people, but I can't exclude this possibility. We can all only hope for the best. People are looking for a reason. They try to find a personification of, they f of their fears. And for a lot of people, unfortunately, it's the foreigners. Germany has experienced a dramatic rise in neo-Nazi attacks, not only on foreigners and religious groups, especially Jews, but on almost every minority. And despite official declarations that Jews in Germany would never again be persecuted, Jewish cemeteries have been desecrated with swastikas and anti-Semitic slogans. In 1994, in the city of Lübeck, the country's oldest synagogue was firebombed on the eve of Passover. Jewish leaders described the firebombing of the Lubeck synagogue as the worst such attack since the infamous Kristallnacht in 1938, when 267 synagogues throughout Germany were burned by Hitler's stormtroopers. More than a half million Jews lived in Germany before the Holocaust. Today, there are fewer than 35,000. You cannot declare what is anti-Semitism with one phrase. Absolutely impossible. Anti-Semitism has many faces. Political, cultural, economic, scientific, racist. You have you cannot bring it in, in one, say, this is anti-Semitism. And also, hate of foreigners has also many faces. So far as we know, 17 people have been killed. But of course, many more than that have been injured. The number is not absolutely definite, but according to official statistics, there have been 3,000 cases registered of violence against Muslim Turks. 
What we need today is for this problem to be discussed openly in public. Politicians need to be made aware of this issue because there is hardly any awareness concerning the problems of religious freedom. In Germany, this is caused by a lack of understanding of this issue. The way things are now, the larger churches are not inclined to promote or influence any discussion in a positive way. They hold back, except to assert their own specific agendas against minority religions. They do not see that an atmosphere is being created which in the end will also hurt them. Germany is a country steeped in religious history. Long before Martin Luther led the German Reformation of 1530, politics and religion were old bedfellows. Now the established churches play an important role in politics. Many of the country's politicians come from the two main churches and authorities even collect taxes on behalf of the established religions. In recent years, however, membership in these churches has declined and their power has begun to erode. In our work on integration of immigrants, we've certainly come to see that the religious factor is one that you can't ignore. When we started this work, we hadn't taken that into consideration, but not only in Germany, but in other countries, the presence of uh, religious groups, which are relatively unfamiliar in Europe, um, is one of the factors which makes the host population worry about immigration. The Commission has had uh, uh, an opportunity in one case to make that very clear that the separation of church and state is, uh, that is the basis of uh, the re religious uh, uh, freedom. I cannot see a situation uh, where in the foreseeable future we will have a separation between church and state in Germany. And I think uh, this uh, view has got solid arguments for it. Uh, the German situation, I think, is um, particular in this respect, that we did not have a, an absolute separation between church and state, but a cooperation. The church, the established churches, naturally have a greater influence on the German law, uh, because they are a lobby group, like every other group, but a group which re represent uh, quite a lot of people. And therefore, they have a certain kind of influence uh, on legislation in Parliament, uh, in the committees, and uh, simply by lobbying. There is a rather big influence, as a matter of fact, of churches in German politics. I uh, think it would be better to have a changed uh, a system of church taxes. For instance, that this big amount of money uh, which is collected by church taxes would be given to the local communities and not to the bishops, not to these big entities, so that the Archbishop of Cologne can uh, say that he has more money to his disposition than the, even the Vatican. I think that is not the sound system. With regard to the future of Europe, when Europe is united, there will surely come a time when the notion of church taxes is an anachronism. We support our own organizations and programs through donations and through membership. And we get by on that, not in grand style, but we get by. And the churches could take a lesson from that. And I certainly think that a sort of arrogance and also a certain influence comes from receiving this financial support that the state gives to the churches, not only from general taxes, but also from church taxes. It is very seductive and represents a kind of temptation. Is it really a human rights issue at the moment? I would doubt. But I think Germany has much to learn in general to accept that there is more than Christianity, that there is more than one or two churches. Germany has to learn that the world has many religions, that God has sent many religions in history to mankind. Germany is one of the few countries in the world where the two main Christian churches, Lutheran and Catholic, 
appoint so-called sect experts in almost every town to monitor the activities of other religious groups, including Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, and Mormons. These sect experts are paid out of the church taxes collected by the federal government on behalf of the established religions. Payment of the tax is said to be voluntary, but a coercion factor does exist. Anyone electing not to pay it is asked to resign from the church, and as a result is ostracized in their community. The government collects more than 17 billion Deutschmarks, about 10 billion US dollars, annually for these churches. The collection of this controversial tax is a major concern in a climate of increased intolerance and repression. If you have just religious sects or minority groups who want to live in peace and freedom, I don't think we have any problem. But if you have uh, very militant minority groups or uh, socially uh, virulent, like let's say, uh, uh, get into the youth with occultism and spiritism and uh, uh, extreme political ideas, then they can, of course, pose a threat. The Inquisition is uh, the working together of the churches, like the Catholic and the Protestant Church, he has even the Protestant Church in an inquisitional position, and, po and the po political groups. And the purpose is to destroy uh, other smaller groups um, because they are a danger to their flock. Die Leute werden es schon merken, nur das ist eine große Aufklärungsarbeit jetzt in den verschiedensten There is a very important task which involves various groups and organizations, including the official churches, as I might call them, uh, that is to say the Protestant and the Catholic churches. And that task is the widespread dissemination of information about what one could refer to as bad religions. One assumes that any religion must in itself be good, but people need to be informed that certain religions can also be bad and can destroy people. Since 20 years, the church is attacked for various reasons, right? But since three years, it's very extreme that single members, members get attacked children get thrown out of kindergarten because their parents are Scientologists. Scientology members are not allowed to participate in political parties because of their religious belief. The most important sects, and uh, I have trouble using this term, but uh, let's stay with it anyway, are probably the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Neo-Apostolical Church which is larger in numbers than Jehovah's Witnesses. The Mormons are also included in the traditional sects in this country. The Seventh-day Adventists uh, present a special problem here because they want to, to be absolutely accepted as a free church. If you really want to destroy somebody's reputation or his business, you can call him a member of a sect. A Lutheran priest came to the village where I live here, and he spread the rumor that I'm a member of a sect. He told people, politicians, he told them that this uh, place here where I live is not a studio, it's just a cover He said, this is the center of a sect, and I am one of the top guys of the sect. And the only reason that I moved to this village is to uh, lure the children in and brainwash them and make them the slaves. So I experienced the uh, Middle Age. And uh, they were writing letters to all the politicians here. And uh, I had to, to sue this guy and fight with court cases to stop the whole thing. But this is going on whenever I exhibit, it's the same thing.
1977, representatives of the Catholic and Protestant churches presented a petition to the tax office with the stated purpose, according to the press, of disallowing religious minorities' non-profit status, in other words, tax exemption, in the future. The Minister of Finance informed them that this was not legally possible. What actually happened, however, was that eight weeks later the tax inspectors came to our church and conducted a very detailed examination of our organization. These were the same tax inspectors who would normally be sent to investigate the records of the big banks in Frankfurt and wouldn't be bothered with a small organization like us. After the investigation, which took weeks, they produced a report which tried to prove that the Unification Church should not be granted tax exemption or non-profit status. This matter has been in court for 17 years. Currently, we have a complaint of unconstitutionality pending. I think the, the most important way in which the churches influence politics in this country is that a number, a great number of politicians come out of the churches and are themselves very important representatives of the churches. If you just take the, the president of the republic, he is a very prominent Protestant Christian. And if you look at the speeches he does, at the initiatives he takes, you will very soon and very quickly realize that he comes from a church background. And then you can go through nearly all active politicians, you will always see that the majority of them are Christians, Catholic, or Protestant, or free churches. What we see now is a joining of forces between the right-wing extremists, the skinheads, the fascists in the street, and the media, as well as the politicians. Günter Grass, the well-known German writer who recently left the Social Democratic Party, made this very clear. Mainstream politicians insist Germany has learned from the sins of the past. But many observers point to these recent incidents across the country as proof that this hatred of others is still very real. There are weak people in the government. That's the problem. Under a chancellor who is a weak man, who cannot uh, decide himself to do this or that, and so we have a real uh, governmental crisis already just since, uh, since reunification. I think uh, many countries have the problem of uh, a right-wing group. You have Nazis also in the United States, also in France and in other countries. But I still think it's different. There is a difference to this country, because in this country, in the past, the people who gave the orders, the leaders of all these different types of Nazis in the past, they always were sitting in the parliament. They were always sitting in the government. They were always on top. The people on the street are just being used. That's the problem. It was uh, in the Nazi time the same. Hitler. Uh, when he started, uh, was dressed like a real um, politician. No uniforms, tie, he looked very decent. One thing that I want, of course, and this is part of my work in politics, is for politics not to be enacted in the streets, but in Parliament instead. And for that reason, I'm putting myself forward for my country and my fellow citizens and attempting to be voted into Parliament where I can represent them, not out in the street with a knife in my hand, but in Parliament. These out-of-control youth had to have been influenced by somebody and that there's an overall right-wing atmosphere that dominates things at the moment. They are organizing themselves and I am also sure that uh, part uh, of the uh, heads of the extremely right-wing parties are involved and in connection and contact with them. In general, we still have to be concerned. The danger is there. They are looking for targets. 
Once the one target is over, they will look to other targets. This is clear. But who will be the target, we cannot say. Germany has never presented itself as a country of immigrants, but rather as a nation state, based on a law that states a German can only be someone with German blood. And this implies discrimination right from the start. Americans have it easier, Britons have it easier, and so do other people. This whole notion has been over-cultivated in Germany, and after the war, people missed the opportunity to work out this issue honestly. People didn't fill up the trenches, didn't level them, they simply covered them up. And in the conflict between the old and the young generations, these issues break open anew. This means that in reality, there's a seamless connection between 1945 and the present, because people missed their chance of really making a clean break with the past. What is worse is probably the kind of intolerance you find uh, with uh, political parties, trade unions, uh, uh, whatever, all sides of groups uh, where, where um, uh, certain, certain, certain newspapers or certain media where actually this question of um, more conflict in society seems to be uh, most interesting and nothing that people actually try to get down, but that they try to keep burning. So there are many people active on keeping these flames burning, and I don't always understand their motives. Maybe in the next general election of 94, uh, the right-wing party gain, or right-wing groups gain between 5 or 10 percent of the parliamentary, parliamentary votes. But what is the most important thing is not the parliamentary, par parliamentary representation of these right-wing parties, but their enormous aggressiveness. I am afraid that we must expect uh, further intolerance and further uh, violent um, attacks. And the general... Um, th the general impression is that the, th the threshold to, to violence, to political violence, has been lowered in Germany, at least within a, a segment of uh, the uh, electorate. They are in an upper good position, the Republicans or the others, because they will never answer you what they wish. This is the matter. They cannot come and say open, we wish to have a restitution of the Nazi party. This could not happen. In Austria, we have a, a special law, uh, you know, for a such thing when somebody will say, uh, I wish to create a new, a new uh, Nazi party. It's for only, <laughs> for this one phrase, he can get minimum three years. And in Germany also, uh, don't forget what happened uh, in, in, uh, during the Nazi period in whole Europe. Uh, you cannot compare with the whole human history, and they know it. How does a country that presided over the extermination of millions ever again single out a people for persecution? How does a modern industrial Western democracy condone such bigotry? The official German view is that it doesn't. But many minorities in Germany today insist that they have to deal with hatred, discrimination, and bigotry every day of their lives. As the frustration mounts, a growing number of Germans are taking responsibility by peacefully protesting the abuses against foreigners as well as their fellow countrymen. The same spirit that brought down the Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall still lives in the hearts and souls of many German citizens who refuse to let their country backslide into its past abuses.
I would like to say once again that there are fascist movements in all the European countries which should not be underestimated. But I have to assess the situation in Germany all the more critically because in this country they have started to burn human beings. This has not been done in other countries. But for me this burning of people is a symptom a symptom that people are not shying away from violence if they think it might eventually be an effective way to get foreigners out of the country. The intolerance, I feel, will continue to grow in this country until one recognizes the real reasons for this kind of fascism that is uh, happening now. And the real reasons are not economical, are not political, they are spiritual. Why do you hate other people so much that you want to kill them? Yeah? This was the phenomenon in the 30s, this is the phenomenon now. Germany, this country, uh, very recently committed one of the biggest crimes in the history of mankind. And, uh, the shock for me personally is that after such a short period of time uh, they start to act very similar. So for me it gets real that the same thing could happen again. I will tell you, <laughs> when you are unhappy you look the guilt by the others and not by yourself. And this is the first step to the intolerance. Make the others responsible.